some time ago, I read a very helpful book written by New York psychiatrist Smiley Blanton entitled The Healing Power of Poetry. In his book, Dr. Blanton explains that for the last 40 years, he had gone around among people trying to help them cure their emotional disturbances and their psychiatric problems by the use of great ideas. These ideas not, uh, did not necessarily have to be in poetic form. Dr. Blanton al also used the great scriptures and the stimulating prose and the great hymns. And as I thought about this great power that each of us can exercise, I thought it must be related very closely to the power of a mother, where she has the ability to cure the hurts and bruises of her child by her caresses and by an expression of her love and sympathy. Some time ago, I heard of a doctor who goes around, write, a medical doctor who goes around writing prescriptions for people to be filled not at drugstores but at bookstores because he has learned that there is more healing power can come out of a book than out of a bottle. And as I contemplated this great uh, ability that we have, I wondered about some of the things that Jesus must have had in mind when he said, Physician, heal thyself. And then it seemed to me that he was giving us some of the details for one important method of this procedure when he instructed Emma Smith to make a selection of the great hymns that we might run them through our minds and hearts not only during our religious service but uh, when we have other need. Now, I've heard of this collection for a great many years, but I've never seen the collection or examined it until last week. And then I went to the library and obtained this little volume, which is a uh, a copy of her research in which she has written down these 90 great poems, these 90 great hymns. They don't have any music with them. They, they have just the words. Sometimes we sing our songs out of the songbook. We sing our hymns and other music out of the songbook, or we read our scriptures out of the scriptures, and sometimes they float across our minds so easily that we don't stamp them deep enough into our minds really to get the message. And sometimes when we get so we can't read very well, then we have to troll a la 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 instead of getting the real message that the scriptures intended. And as I read and examined this book uh, written as a result of the research of Emma Smith, I decided that I would like, and I think maybe it might be a pretty good idea for each one of us to make a selection of his own. We each have our own needs, and there have been a lot of great hymns, as evidenced by some of the things that have been sung by the choir and all of us at this conference. There are some great hymns that uh, maybe we ought to memorize and know a little bit more about so that we could sing them in order to solve our own problems and the problems of others. Some time ago, a man and his wife came in to talk about a great tragedy that had just taken place in their home where their little three-year-old daughter had, without warning, suddenly passed away before their eyes. They were heartbroken, of course, and they'd cried many tears, but the pain didn't go away, and they thought they'd like to talk to somebody about it, and they came in, and we discussed it, and I thought I knew something about the healing power of a willing ear, and I thought I had some qualification to discuss their problem with them. As many years ago, when I was a very young man, I sat by the bedside of my little seven-year-old sister for several hours and watched her die, this little sister I loved very much, and I thought I knew something about their, the pain that they might uh, have an increased amount of. They knew they were perfectly familiar with the great scripture that when one dies in his innocence and purity, that child is, a, is eligible for the celestial kingdom. And we sympathized and discussed it uh, for a while, and. But the mother kept saying that there wasn't anything that could happen that would be quite as bad. 
as to have a little, a beautiful, little, intelligent three-year-old die almost before her life had began. And after I thought the purpose of the interview had been pretty well taken care of, I said to her, Sister Jones, if you think it might help you, I think I could tell you something. If you think it would help, to that would be much worse than your present grief. She felt pretty sure that there wasn't anything that bad, but said, if you know of something that would be worse than that, I'd like to know what it was. And so I recited uh, to her James, Whit James Whitcomb Riley's poem, Bereaved. Now, this wasn't the story of one who was be of a mother who was bereaved for the loss of a child. It was the story of one who was bereaved because she didn't have any children. And this woman said to her bereaved friend, let me come in where you sit weeping. A, let me who have no child to die weep with you for the loss of that little one whose love I have known nothing of. Let me imagine those little arms that slowly, slowly loose their pressure around your neck, those hands you used to kiss, such hands, such arms I never knew. For them, will you not let me come and weep with you? Out of an empty heart, it may be I can say something between the tears that may be comforting. For ah, how sadder than yourself am I, who weep alone, because I had no child to die. And I'm very grateful to this great author for putting this idea together. And then I thought of all of the other people that have written great hymns and great philosophies based on the scripture and other truth. And so I decided to compile my own volume of a, a poetry of bereavement out of the great scriptures and out of my own notes of the things that I loved, I have compiled a, a great collection of things that have a great power to stir me. But there's a, there's a great poetry of every other success. There's a poetry of courage. There's a poetry of faith. This little book of, that was written by Emma Smith, just think what a great thing it would be if every, everyone in the world memorized 90 of the great hymns, 90 of the things that he could run through his own mind. The Lord has said that the song of the heart is a prayer unto him, and it will be answered with blessings upon our heads. Each morning as I walk to work, I have about an hour, a little less than that, but uh, approximately that much time that I can think the thoughts that I'd like to think and the thoughts that give me the greatest thrill, and, and I like to recite some of these prayers that I think would be prayers to God, and somebody has helped me with the words. In one of them, someone said this, O God, I thank Thee for each sight of beauty that Thy world doth give, for sunny sky and air and light. O God, I thank Thee that I live, that life I consecrate to Thee, and ever as the day is born, on wings of joy my soul doth flee, and thank thee for another morn, another morn in which to pass some silent deed of love abroad, that greeting as it journeys past may do some earnest work for God. Somebody has said that the poets stand next to the prophets in their ability to lift us up. For example, I have never heard Eliza R. Snow being sustained as a prophet, seer, and revelator, and yet she wrote, O oh, my father. Now, sometimes we miss the great, the great message. I'm sure that you would not like me to, this afternoon, sing to you, O oh, my father. But I hope that you will not object too seriously if I recite to you these thrilling words. Sister Snow said, O oh, my Father, thou that dwellest in that high and glorious place, when shall I regain thy presence and again behold thy face? In thy holy habitation did my spirit once reside? In my first primeval childhood was I nurtured near thy side. Verse number two, for a wise and glorious purpose thou hast placed me here on earth 
and withheld the recollection of my former friends and birth. Yet oft times a secret something whispers, you're a stranger here, and I felt that I had wandered from a more exalted sphere. Verse number three, I had learned to call thee Father through thy spirit from on high, but until the key of knowledge was restored, I knew not why. In the heavens are parents single? No, the thought makes reason stare. Truth is reason. Truth eternal tells me I've a mother there. And then in the fourth verse, when I leave this frail existence, when I lay this mortal by, Father, Mother, may I meet you in your royal courts on high. Then at length, when I've completed all you sent me forth to do, with your mutual approbation, let me come and dwell with you. And so, so Sister Snow transmits on to us the, the knowledge of the prophets and with them. Somebody has said that poetry is language dressed up in its best clothes. And so she helps us to be impressed by them and make of our own lives the thing that we would like to have. One, a, a great uh, Harvard psychologist one time said, or asked this question, how would you like to create your own mind? But isn't that just exactly what we all do? He said the mind is made up by what it feeds upon. He said the mind, like the dyer's hand, is colored by what it holds. That is, if I hold in my hand a sponge full of purple dye, my hand becomes purple. But if I hold in my mind and heart great ideas of faith and enthusiasm and righteousness, my whole personality is changed accordingly. In the Library of Congress, one of our great, the sections of our great literature is written under the title of Poems of Faith and Freedom. And someone has said to everyone upon this earth, Death cometh soon or late, and every man must may give his life to something good and great. And how can man die better than in, serve, in serving and facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? And sometimes when we get along a little in our lives in age and things don't always go just right and we have some physical problems and other things, we might comfort ourselves with, there's a, there's a poetry of courage and a poetry of industry and a poetry of enthusiasm. Someone wrote this under the title of Carry On. He said, things may not look well, but then you never can tell. So carry on, old man, carry on. Be proud of your mission. Greet life with a cheer. Give it all that you've got. That's why you're here. Fight the good fight and be true to the end. And at last, when you die, let this be your cry, carry on, my soul, carry on. And I would like to extend my blessing and appreciation to each one of you in the words that were used by some of the ancients uh, back a long time ago in which they said to those they loved, may the road rise up to meet you. May the, may the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain fall gently in your fields. And now and forever, may God hold you lovingly in the hollow of his hand, and that it may always be so. I sincerely pray in the name of Jesus Christ, 